Hi, most of you know me. I'm David Thorburn, director of the Communications Forum. Uh, I, let me begin by saying we're missing, as you may have noticed, two speakers. Uh, uh, those two speakers are casualties in different ways of the writers of the ending of the writer's strike, and we'll have some things to say about the writer's strike shortly. I regret there uh, the loss of uh, Barbara Hall and Howard Gordon, both of whom are distinguished, uh, uh, have distinguished careers in television, and would have uh, had, I think, many interesting things to say. But I must admit that I that I'm not distraught over this fact because uh, the man to my right, John Romano an old friend and, and uh, comrade of mine, uh, is uh, among the most articulate Hollywood folks I know. And, and as you'll see from what I'll say in a few moments, there, are, there is a partial explanation for that. By articulate, I mean capable of talking to audiences in the way very good teachers do. Uh, uh, John Romano has been a writer and producer on more than a dozen shows, on uh, a dozen television shows, uh, including some that he created himself. Uh, uh, among, his t among the titles that John has, has, uh, had, uh, has worked on, um, among the shows John has worked on, either as a writer or sometimes as a writer-producer, sometimes actually as the showrunner, the supervising producer who's responsible for the whole, for the whole activity of the, uh, of the program, uh, among the shows that uh, he's been associated with are Hill Street Blues, uh, let, me look, let me look at my list because it's actually such an impressive one, uh, uh, a show, a, a little-known show that, uh, uh, called Beverly Hills Bunts, which, is one, uh, which was a spin-off of Hill Street Blues, a show called Sweet Justice, which John created. Uh, uh, he worked on, on, on Knott's Landing. He, he wrote the pilot episode of 24. He's written episodes of Monk. He uh, uh, has, was the showrunner, uh, executive producer over a number of uh, 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 seasons for American Dreams. He was the executive producer and a writer on Third Watch. He's worked on Providence. Uh, among two shows, not long-lasting shows, but shows that deserve a place in the, in the uh, Hall of Fame of shows that lasted only a short time but were intellectually and artistically very distinguished, are two shows he created. Uh, one with the, with the actor David Caruso uh, uh, called Michael Hayes, and another show a, a, a show very dear to my heart because it was sort of set in a college campus. I kept hoping he'd create a Professor Thorburn on the show, but he never did. A show called Class of '96. So he's so he uh, he's, he had uh, has had a a a, a, a very uh, creative and productive career as a as a television uh, writer and uh, and producer. But in recent years, he's moved more and more toward into the movies, and and uh, his his screenwriting credits uh, are impressive in an even more remarkable way, I think, in some degree. He, his credits include The Third Miracle, the Coen Brothers film Intolerable Cruelty, a forthcoming film starring Richard Gere called Knights in Rodanthe. Uh, all these things would make uh, John Romano a remarkable and interesting man in any, in any environment. But I think that there's a side of his of his career that I that is even more interesting, uh, especially an interesting profile for a television writer. John has a PhD from Yale, where he got where where, where he studied English under many very distinguished professors, and he. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 after earning his PhD at Yale, he, 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 went, he, he took a job in the English department at Columbia University and was a beloved and much admired young teacher at Columbia. And while he was at Columbia, he wrote a wonderful book, an academic book, and I think he must be the only creator of a television program who's published a book with the Columbia University Press about Charles Dickens. It's a wonderful book. It's called Dickens and Reality. It's a very thoughtful, intelligent piece of sophisticated literary criticism, and it's one of the reasons that I treasure John uh, as a writer and as a and as a friend. Uh, it's really an, uh, very, very. It's one of the one of the one of the few rewards you get for getting old as a teacher is that is that sometimes your students achieve so much and come back and they're guests on forums that you run, and it's a very very exciting experience. Um, uh, I certainly feel that about John, about John's visit today. Uh, I, I thought that, uh, and, and the plan is to do as we normally do with a forum. John and I will have a kind of conversation about some matters related to, to television and media for the first hour, and then we'll throw it open for 
questions and comments from the audience. We also have some clips that we hope to show, uh, and John will comment on them. And I, I think this will give us, a, a, a hopefully, a, a particularly uh, immediate insight into, into, the, into, the, into the art and commerce of television. Uh, John, let's begin by, by talking about, a bit about the strike. Uh, Howard Gordon, who uh, the the showrunner for Twenty Four, who was supposed to have joined John on the, uh, one of the people who was supposed to have joined John on the panel today, uh, sent me an email the day after the writer strike was solved, uh, was 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 uh, uh, ended, was what was resolved, saying, expressing great apologies and saying he just he, that that, uh, that he he was just overwhelmed with with uh, responsibilities now that the strike had ended and uh, he, he he was sorry. Uh, not to be able to do it. Uh, Barbara Hall did not back out immediately, although I began to ner I began to get uneasy about it. And but I, but apparently she the, the the pressure of work became so heavy on her that she got that she became ill, and uh, she she had to back out uh, m much more recently because because of illness. And I, I I am sorry about that. My hope is both of them will be able to return to a forum at a later stage. Uh, but let's turn to the question of the strike, John, and begin by the, but with, with that, and have you make some comments about that. There are many people who feel that the, uh, that, that, that the, that the strike accomplished very little for the writers. Uh, and, I, and the first question I have for you is, do you think that anything useful happened because of the strike? Second question, I've also read a good deal by people commenting on the strike, saying that they thought that the strike signaled a, a, a change, perhaps a fundamental change, in the economic structure of the TV industry. And I'm wondering if you could begin by commenting on those things. Well, I'll take a second one first. It was too, it's too soon to know what kind of change it uh, signals. Um, I, I, uh, I'm sure it signals change. We live in a time when it's, you know, the television industry is being hit by all sorts of changes. If we were talking with some of your students earlier about watching downloaded episodes of Lost and, you know, just people sending out. Uh, some people catch up with 24 through little minutes that are sent over your cell phone. I mean, clearly there's change. And the, the, the way of catching up with a show or, getting, or watching a show exclusively through, through uh, DVDs you buy in a box or going on demand and deciding to catch up on a show you didn't see and watching every episode of In Treatment from the beginning. Um, you know, I mean, these are all things that were not there 20 years ago. And in each case, there's a financial consequence. And in each case, as a writer, you say, well, uh, so who makes money when uh, my sister backs up to see the episodes uh, of last season's uh, favorite show? Uh, when, when, when somebody makes money, are they, are, uh, can I make sure they're passing that on to me? It's simply about money. Um, but you have to understand that you wrote the darn thing. And the idea that some, and you wrote it to be, to be put on the air, and now someone has found another way of selling it out of the back of their truck, and they had no intention of giving you a piece of that. And I mean, I'm not the world's biggest union guy. I was not active in the strike. I participated in the strike. I did not break the strike. I carried, to my daughter's amusement, I actually carried a, a sign and walked in a picket line. Um, but... Uh, so I, you're not talking to uh, you know Tom Hayden here. I'm not exactly the world's greatest uh, union uh, organizer, but uh, there's a common sense fairness that that you should participate in the profits of your work if other people are going to, and if not, not. And the studios, I will say, it's you know this is no point reopening uh, uh, these wounds, but the studios did seem to have a kind of little wet dream that they were actually going to um, profit from the internet retransmission of old television shows and not share the money with anybody. That really did seem to be in their little minds. And that's just common sense, uh, common sense unfairness. I mean, there's just a, f and that's all, without getting very excited, because I believe me, I don't have it in me on these subjects. Um, it, it seemed like, Zero percent was probably the wrong number, and we can go from there. And then the number we ended up with was not very exciting, but it was better than zero, and the principle is on the table, and that was not there before. And so good for us, I guess. I hated being on strike. <laughs>
So I can't, you, it's why you're not getting, I'm not singing any Joe Hill songs or anything. But uh, so a, a, for those a, of you who have. A mixed verdict on, on the show. No, no, I think it was, we, we got something valuable. It's on the, it's, it's now, it's, it's a, now on the table. So it doesn't matter that it isn't a lot of money, the idea that the principle was accepted. Yes, you can't, people. you can't sell my stuff in any way, shape, or form. You know, the comic book version, the novelization, the one minute on my cell phone, the, the video game. If I wrote it, you've got to give me something of the money you're making by, by getting it out there through those media. That's all. It's, I'm not, it's not a religious principle. It's just... All right. Uh, this may have also, in part, been a consequence of the strike, but I remember uh, noticing in the... Uh, Every Monday, the New York Times, in, in its business section, runs a, a, a page that I'm sure everyone in Hollywood looks at closely. It lists uh, the, uh, the the movie grosses for the week, and it lists the top-rated television shows. Right, and one of the things, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of that of those tables uh, was the uh, fact that. It, you had to go down to number six or seven before you came, in terms of the number, the, the programs that had gotten the largest audiences, you had to get down to number six or seven before you came to a story show, a fiction huh. show, huh. a series. Whereas, you know, 15 years ago, every single show in the top 10 or 15 would have been, or almost every single show, unless there was a Super Bowl. That Except week. for 60 Minutes. <laughs> uh, or 60 Minutes. Well, even 60 Minutes. But yes, you're right about that. 60 Minutes was always a Always number two. Show. But, but uh, the number of, the number of uh, fiction shows would be overwhelming on those lists, and that has declined. Now, part of it surely was the strike, and they, 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 they had stopped putting some of the fiction shows on during the strike. But even if we allow for that, John, in the last five years or so, oh, yeah, yeah. A, a much larger number of reality-based non-fiction programs have been getting audiences larger than the fiction shows. So, the, so one way into this sort of broader conversation I want to have with you has to do with, what, do you think that it's actually a, 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 does it feel to people in Hollywood like a kind of permanent change that so much more of prime time is now devoted to things that are not stories, that are not fiction, not series, not movies? Well, or, the, or do they feel that, that'll, that, that, that stories will return? That they'll, that well, the, 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 uh, the quantitative answer, uh, trivially, is that you're, uh, you're right. Um, there used to be, most of the shows used to be story, script-oriented, character-based, fictional narratives. Most of the shows in the top 20, and now fewer than most. Um, uh, and... Uh, and but, here, but the reality is that if, you, if what you do for a living, if there are students in the audience or people in the audience who, who want to tell stories and they want to tell them in the format of television, um, there is and probably will be for the foreseeable future um, always an appetite for the next really terrific one. Um, and any executive who is here, if you, you should have executives here. You should have... Uh, people who uh, dress better than myself and, 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 and look at it things from the corporate side. Uh, some of them are uh, you know, remarkable, creative uh, individuals, uh, men and women, believe it or not. Um, and they would say, look, if someone walks through the door and tells me a story you taped the top of my head off um, about people that, that, that he or she made up, um, I'm going to bet that it's going to take off the uh, the same head and the large numbers of people. I bet there's money in that. That sounds great to me. Let's do it. There'll always be an appetite for that. Now, what's changed is that on the networks, on the five networks, and in a and they're 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 closely related cable stations like USA, FX. Um, there, the notion of what makes a story and characters thrilling is more. Um, aggressive, less literary, less about the language, higher concept, crazier, faster. And if you have an idea which really has to do with the transactions between human beings, if you're sort of more on the Jane Austen end of things than on the J.J. Uh, Abrams end of things, you're probably going to go, you're going to, and you know, this happens to me every week. Tell everyone who J.J. Abrams is. I was going to say, tell everyone who Jane Austen is. Um, but they, she obviously They has, all know who Jane is. She has more movies out than he does. Um, <laughs> You know, he's a the guy better who, movies too, a, creator, right? a creator of like Lost and Alias, those kinds of television shows, and 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 um, as opposed to Jane Austen. Um, 
if you're, if you're closer to the character narrative storytelling end of things, if, you, if, this, if, if your imagination is giving you really, it, to your, your mind, interesting, sexy, attractive moves within the recognizable normal human psyche with the ordinary number of heads and arms and, and taking place on this planet and li roughly linear time, if that's where your imagination takes you, you'll probably take your idea to... Uh, HBO or Showtime, um, and uh, in less, you're less likely to think that you're restricted to the five networks. If it has a big star in it attached, if you've decided to tell this idea to your friend David Caruso and he wants to, to do the show with you, you probably go to CBS. And if it has six incredibly good-looking young people, that's the nature of idea, if you, uh, who just can't leave each other's uh, little bodies alone, you probably take it to ABC. Um, so there, there are, you know, you have a direction, a sense of sort of directionality. Um, but they, uh, the, um, they'll, they'll still be a place. There are fewer places, and you have to pick your shots more carefully. But there's still a place for narrative storytelling. And yes, you, you've, you've, you've done the numbers correctly. There are more so-called reality shows. Um, and uh, more other types and kinds of things, competitions and, uh, you know, and shows well, there, featuring there, runways. There, there, clearly, there were, there were many factors that, that changed the nature of, of uh, broadcast, well, broadcast you know, you know network what comes out of what you're John, saying? Maybe I heard, but, the, but no, no, I missed but, the real interest of your question. The real interest of your question is why strike now, given you already have a problem, fiction TV writer, right, yes. which is that all these other shows are right, types right. and kinds of shows. Well, yes. I mean, that's true. And a lot of people said, we have enough troubles um, with the rise of it, with fewer people watching uh, ordinary dramatic television to suddenly make that. That business is getting, is losing enough of its flavor for the studios and networks. Why make it even harder by cutting into their imagined uh, profits from new, new media? And that's true. That's a good case to make, sitting around the uh, fire or walking in the uh, picket line. But there remains, for many of us, a kind of, again, what I just call common sense uh, fairness. That, you know, if, well, if as long as they're making some of them, and I wrote some of them, I want some of the money, <laughs> some of the profit. All right, but John, um, let's, 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 shift, let's shift to a to yep. related subject. Okay. Uh, um, um, there were many ways, money, as I started to say, there were many factors helped to explain how network programming, especially fiction programming, has changed since yep. you entered the business in 1980. Um, uh, and and one, 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 one could make an argument that, that the period from the mid-70s sometime through the mid-80s was a very, very remarkable time in television history, maybe its most creative time from the standpoint of fiction programming. But one, and, and there are obviously a, a part, part of the explanation for what happened there has to do with competition from cable and the proliferation of channels and so forth. But one thing that many people have said, and I wonder what your reaction is, I know you have something interesting things to say about this, is that, is that the events of 9-11 had a profound impact on the content of television, on the kinds of stories that were being told on television. That it, uh, and I wondered if you would comment on that a bit and to, to talk to us about how you felt, how you feel the events of 9-11 uh, affected programming and attitudes toward programming, attitudes toward stories and characters. Well, sir, sir, we were just having a very good discussion about the show Lost and that it reflects a kind of post-9-11 paranoia, a kind of, well, I shouldn't call it paranoia. There's genuine fears at stake in here. But a sense that we are uh, an island um, threatened by uh, uh, estranged alien creatures. I mean, there's xenophobia in this. And that we only have each other to depend on, and who knows whether we can depend on each other. I mean, it, there's certainly 9-11 did its fair share to feed um, uh, a lot of impulses, not all of which are admirable. Um, some are just, uh, you know, xenophobia and so forth. But also, it, get, it, it also did a, a sense that I thought was um, palpable. These, are, let me be a little random in my answer. Um, take, for example, the uh, the current Coen Brothers movie, um, uh, a No Country for Old Men, and the evil Javier Bardem character. Our friend Leo Brody made a very good point about this character, aside from the fact that he's a, sort of in the movie of indeterminate uh, uh, foreign uh, origin. Um, 
and he is an implacable evil with a kind of psychology-less, uh, non-humanistic interior so that the evil seems to be sort of presentational surface evil with nothing behind it, uh, which is, I think the technical term is fucking scary on the screen. <laughs> and it resonates with something in the audience which may not have been there before 9-11, um, so that we're, the, uh, the interest, I, I find it a valuable um, in, uh, creatively, you know, it's useful in my, as, as Robert Frost said about the poor, um, they're useful in my work. Um, they're, uh, I find the idea that there's such a thing as good and evil um, is actually uh, of help to a storyteller, so that everything isn't always about um, how are you feeling today, uh, you know, and that's how I'm feeling today. And the answer to all problems, when I was running Party of Five, I used to say it seemed this is a world in which the answer to almost everything is a hug. Um, and it's actually, the world is actually much more interesting than that. 9-11 represents that, that um, part of, of, of our human experience, which is not answerable by a hug. It doesn't mean it's answerable by the Patriot Act, but it's not answerable by a hug. So it, that, that's, that makes stories almost as, as, a, as interesting as the real world, which remains still the winner in any contest so for what's the most you're entertaining actually, and unbelievable. You're, you're offering a kind of positive, in this, in this, in this, in a, you're saying that there's an aesthetically positive Well, no, I mean, the thing is, it's very... I all, thought you were going to say, gee, yeah. all, all, all the television programs became fascist shows about how you should torture people. Well, you know, don't forget, I worked in the pilot for 24. I mean, I, I think that... Which, which, is a fascist, which we're going to show. But, um, which we're going to show you in a well, second. Well, but the point is, the, th the interest, the human interest of a show like that is... Look, what you want to do, you had David Melcher, who has a great, deal, uh, a great deal to teach. And one of the things that David taught when I was a, a, a kid on Hill Street Blues, um, I think 150 years ago, um, was that just he, his instructions were, as you went into your cubicle to write, just jam your character up. Make things as hard for him or her as possible. When you're done making it that possible, you're done. Hand it in. We'll shoot it. That's the job. That's the task. Well, if you want to look at a positive side to 9-11, I mean, lightning is surely going to strike if you make too much of this. But the truth is that it's a very, it, presents, it, it certainly makes thinking about international relations more difficult. And the, the dilemma of, of Kiefer in 24, and I think that if Howard were here, had been able to come, um, we would have had a good time talking about the subsequent history of the show because he's been involved in recent years. I was only there at the beginning. The dilemma that you're serving him, the genuinely interesting dilemma, and if you don't think this is interesting, you're simply uh, mistaken, not about the quality of the show but about the nature of the dilemma, is that there's such a thing as evil out there to fight. Now, I'm not saying it gets characterized uh, with, uh, uh, with um, political accuracy in any given a manifestation of paranoia that comes out of Hollywood or out of the, uh, uh, the, out of the Atlantic, for that matter. But um, I'm saying that suddenly it says you can't answer it by, by sitting down in Act 4 and being, touching knees and being very uh, sensitive and clear, a kind of writing I love doing, by the way. This is, but this is aggressively, it is aggressively the case that Kiefer must be a human being, must cope with his daughter, his family, his own limitations, his own... A point we always made, the fact that he is within himself, not in control, out of control as a person, and yet it is his task to do something about something which, a threat which is really out there. Now, if you premise that, that the, there's no threat really out there, that the only threat you can think of is the Republicans winning in November, there's a part of me that might agree with you, but we're both wrong. There's a good deal more to be concerned about. And the idea of both taking that on and remaining in touch with your humanity, for which read father, husband, person, kid who used to you know, play with marbles, is now, uh, is now torturing <laughs> or being tortured. I mean, the truth is those narrative human dilemmas which can't be comfortably solved, which are not the simple knockoffs of any particular political position, when the human being transcends his politics, um, you're, you've got something interesting to talk about. Have they served it well? Uh, you know, I'd feel more comfortable saying that they haven't if Howard were here to defend it. But there's no question that the dilemma is an authentic one awaiting our next president.
Right. I certainly agree about that. Yeah. I mean, my, my own response is, uh, to, to the question, yeah. in a way, has to do not so much with any individual show, but with the proliferation of law and order kinds of programs. Yeah. In other words, it seems to me that one explanation about the impact of 9-11 is just to say that the country was terrified into a situation in which, or at least Hollywood felt the country was terrified into a situation in which it needed to have programs that reassured it that all of its law enforcement agencies were hooked up to the best technology possible and were geniuses at last-minute torture and that Well, sort the of interesting thing. thing about the proliferation of technology-centered, I mean, the side of 24 that simply bores me, I don't watch very often, but the side of uh, technology, uh, 24 that simply bores me is its techno-spy sh uh, stuff. Uh, but if you look at shows like CSI, um, if you can bear it, the thing about that, about that kind of writing is that, yes, it has a naive faith that, that somehow you will invent the right widget. I mean, I'm here at MIT. It's a, a lively question. Uh, but the interest, but, but the, um, the taste for and the acknowledgement of complexity, there is no widget that will solve. You will still have to make decisions about deploying. And those decisions you will always make a little bit blind. You will always see us through a glass darkly. That is the, that's the deal. So get by all means, uh, let's work on better ones. So b bad technology forensic centered shows are the ones that pretend that the cool toy solves the problem. Good ones show the limitations and the fact that nothing will ever replace. T.S. Eliot said there is no method except to be very intelligent. And nothing ever relieves you. No methodology will ever relieve you of those human dilemmas. Nor will any rightness, right feeling, nor will any way of, no, no ideology, no way, this is me talking and perhaps I'm mistaken, but, but no way of, no correct way of looking at the world is going to spare you how complex problems are. When stories say that, they're doing a good job. I have respect for a show you don't like very much, uh, which is Dick Wolf's Law and Order, and I think in its early days, I haven't seen all the incarnations, and I don't like see it, the, um, the, uh, the ones with like a colon and something after Law and Order, I don't watch those, but the original Law and Order with like Sam Waterston and those incredible uh, uh, people around him. Um, they, they were great shows, and the reason is, A, you didn't know whether they, we, or the team we're rooting for, cops and then prosecutors, would win or not, and B, you didn't know whether they should win or not, and C, they didn't know whether they should win or not. And he always kept those three things in play. And if, like me, you find yourself watching the same ones late at night over and over again, it's because... The ending is not an ending because they had true respect for the fact that, yeah, this, this is a lawyer doing a great job really well. This is a cop doing a great job really well. Guess what? I don't know whether it should go this way, and I don't know how it's going to go. And that kind of respect for the stubborn so your way, argument, which, this is a writer's yeah. argument about the complexity, yeah, yeah. about the, the, about the moral, just a the moral of complexity taste. of the show. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think it just, you know, again, bluntly speaking, it makes for better stories. Okay. It makes for more fun stories. But it's also truer about the world from my um, well, experience. Uh, one way we can concretize some of John's uh, writerly passion is by looking at particular passage. And we are going to now show you a clip. Can we do this? Can we make a transition? What are you going to show? What are you going to show? Tell me what you're going to show. We're going to do the 24. First, we'll oh, the first few minutes. Right, right, We've right. kind of covered that point. Right. Well, let's show the clip, and you can you can you, you can you can say very little about it. But I want people to see it quickly. You okay. I I move on. Can you find it fast? What is the next clip? The next is uh, Hill Street. Do you want to do the? No, no. Okay, do this. Because I thought if we ran out of time, we would just... Well, no, we, you, can, you can... You, I mean, I think... But, but I, want, I think 24-7, I'm going to say the One reason thing. I want to do this is to concretize some of okay, what sure. you've been saying. Okay, sure. Sure. I mean, no, it's, it's one thing to think in sort of abstract terms. But, okay, let's see I mean, One of the things about Romano is he... Is that he... He actually has the job of writing a scene in his head whenever he's talking. And it's... It, it, I think it will be helpful for you to see it. Can you... Can you... Is this it? Can we freeze it for a second? So... John, do you want to give a context for this? There, uh, is it, did you start with the house? Uh, there's no context. This is the this is the first five minutes of the first show. Of the so very the audience first, saw it without context. They uh, saw this is the some very kind first of, episode of. Yeah, so they had no context. So which why John should they wrote, get the context? Which John wrote? Go ahead. Right. I, I rewrote. I rewrote. They had a, they had a good idea for a show, and it was going to take place in 24 hours every week, and uh, I mean yeah. Every uh, uh, I'm sorry. It was going to be an hour every week for 24 episodes. 
and that would be your season. But it would be real-time hour. They, as you know, if you've, they didn't stay with that. Um, it eventually became, you know, every show was 24. I mean, it, it was just too arduous to do real-time for seven years. But um, that was the, they had that idea. They had the idea of Jack um, and this sort of supra-intelligence agency uh, and the idea that the first season would be about a planned uh, assassination, alas, of a black candidate for the U.S. president. All right. So here's Romano's revision of the first, of the, his revised version. Well, it's the version he shot, okay. sort of more or less. His rewrite. Yeah. Is she still giving you the cold shoulder? If by she you're referring to your mother, I'd appreciate it if you call her by her name, Mom. And no, she's just busy. She's busy a lot. It's a school night for you, so time for bed. She was all sweetness and light, right? And then she said something nasty about me. Yeah, and I just busted her on it. And the way you're taking this so personal is just that mother teenage daughter thing. said that you appreciate that. Do you mean you kind of appreciate it? I really appreciate it. it. You really, really appreciate it. You really appreciate it. How much do you appreciate it? Ken. Ken. phone call. Um, uh, the only thing I say about that in relation to what I said that's only just a, another uh, Milch would call an exfoliation of it. idea would be that every line um, from um, I, 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 I think you should call her by her real name Mom, which obviously isn't her name <laughs> to um, I became the enemy, right? To um, uh, they're manipulating you, Jack. To um, all of those have almost uh, have palpable kind of spy military reality, right? It's as if one is saying that the distinction between domestic life and political life has been really uh, has evaporated, or and, and, and you can't. I mean, it was also deliberately. Uh, bland, ordinary scene, which has happened, I mean, in my house any number of nights through my daughter's teenage years. I mean, it, it was deliberately underwritten and, um, except we didn't play chess, as I would go. Um, uh, it was deliberately something that might happen in any home, but it was haunted by the political realities which are his job. He's a spy. So when you say to him you're being manipulated or you're lying, or when he says, I got a good idea, let's tell her we can't play she can't play both of us off each other. You don't hear anything you can't hear in many of our kitchens, but you're also hearing something you might well hear in the back rooms at National Security Agency. There's a kind of sense in which 
it's those lives. So that's the kind of thing that, that I have in mind. Both those worlds are... Now, it turns out she's not just gone. I mean, she wouldn't be the first teenage girl to jump out the window, I mean, to, to leave. But very few are being abducted by international spies. Um, uh, but but you, can, you see the point, uh, really, that I'm making. These are essentially human... The, the political dilemmas are essentially human dilemmas. The human dilemmas have a d political dimension. And that's where we is. What, wait, John, were you implying what I feel is the case, is that as 24 went on, it, it, it became less and less interested in that human dimension? Yeah, I think there was no... I don't think the development of... Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to say too much about the show. I mean, there's there certainly... There's certainly been a... It, 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 it's like a lot of us, our politics have damaged its... Um, it's uh, social, it's manners, it's, de it's sense of civility and decency. I mean, I, it's a lot to say about the show. I never, I, you know, the torture stuff was, again, without Howard here, I don't want the conversation. Right, well, I, I, uh, we're going to skip to the third example. Uh, uh, but, I, I, but, I mean, does anyone have a reaction? To what, I mean, am I throwing off your format? Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. Because, I mean, let, let, can, me, let me, let, let, yeah. I'm the boss here. Okay, right? I know, I know. So, look, uh, what but, I mean, I just showed him a piece. Right, right. But I, I wanna, I, what I want to do now is I want to I show you another clip to give you, so show you, in a way, another side of John, another side of television. One of the most interesting things about American television in the 80s and 90s, in part because of competition from so many new sources and, and the proliferation of channels was that, in an odd way, broadcast television, the television that we associate with the major networks, became in its own way very experimental. And there were a whole series of programs that appeared in the 80s and 90s, some of which lasted only a few, uh, only a few episodes. They often had more episodes in the can than they actually showed because the it, the, the networks were so impatient, not allowing them to generate an audience. If they got very low ratings, they would knock them off the air uh, very quickly. Uh, and uh, one such program is, is uh, in, it, for me, it's sort of the embodiment of this whole group of programs. There, there must be at least a dozen such shows, ser series television programs, that uh, took liberties with various generic expectations. And here is a particularly dramatic example of such a program. Uh, in its introduction, it uses a scene in, the, in, a, in a police station, a, a roll call, and it's a very explicit allusion to the way in which uh, Hill Street Blues al almost always began. Almost always the very first scene in Hill Street Blues was a scene in the, in the, in, at, at roll call where the sergeant at arms would be giving assignments to various people. And the, the scene you're about to see, it's from the, I think, the first episode of, of this program. No. Be, or, or from a recent episode, and from, a, from one, one of the f very few that were broadcast. It was only on right. 11, 11 right. episodes. Right. And this is from maybe the second or third week, but it doesn't matter, I mean, because it's the very beginning of the show. But you'll get, you'll get a sense of what's going on there, and I, you'll see why I haven't mentioned the title, even though you probably were able to read it on the screen. I think I'll look at this, too. Item 7, November 29, 3 p.m., conflict resolution seminar in this room, attendance mandatory. You got a conflict with that? Yeah, I do. It's resolved. You're going. <laughs> Item 8, Officer Quinn returns to active duty roster tomorrow. So, Jaeger, you'll ride with Ceruto. Oh, look, give me a break. Jaeger's got yak breath. I can't ride with you. So wear a gas mask. Item last on the teletype, we still got the Franklin Avenue flasher. Struck at two outdoor weddings and a school picnic so far this month. Male cock, 6'3", look for tattoos in unusual places. Okay, that's it. And hey, hey, let's be careful out there. Let's be careful out there. Okay. All right. 
sorry you couldn't get the whole song. But come up. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're And in fact, I mean, the show is called Cop Rock, uh, <laughs> and it was a police musical, a, really a, poli a cop opera, really. And uh, every and John can describe it more fully than I because I he worked on the show. It. But every every episode had a number of original songs in in it, right? Uh, uh, really five. Good. So five in every episode. One of the yeah. things that went wrong is that Stephen Bosco declared, decreed that we would have five songs in every show. This meant that if three of them were okay and two of them were less than okay, we were still going to have five songs in every show. Uh, now, you know, a bad scene, you can get a sandwich. I mean, a bad song, you just flipped it. You know, I mean, a bad song is... is no, I, I, I don't remember, John, were you here before when I showed this? I've shown this, I've showed this once before at the forum. Uh, and it got m much more of a reaction than you folks reacted. I mean, you don't know, that may, be, may have been a very strong you, reaction, re but, but just it, unexpressed. Yeah, maybe so. But it, it, the show was a catastrophe from every... In fact, John was embarrassed. When I first uh, me mentioned it in public, John was embarrassed as if it were... A, it it a, has a, a huge following. It has a... It has a... It has a, um, it has a following. It ha you know, people are... Trio recently made a documentary about the making of Cop Rock, but it's a slightly bemused... You know, uh, it, it's, it has a huge camp following, I can tell you, in the sense of camp. Um, but it also, well, a lot what, of people liked what, it as much you as think, you did. What do you think went wrong, Jim? Well, what I think, mean? well, listen, I think that you'll, you'll learn something. That, you know, th here's the three rules of history. You know, you don't march on Moscow, you don't find a land war in Asia, and you don't make cops sing on television. Those are, <laughs> uh, um, those, that's, I think, what we learned making cop rock. I'll tell you something interesting about what really went wrong. Um, it, the first episode had songs by Randy Newman, and they were uh, great songs. And then we had Amanda um, wrote the Rose. Amanda, uh, I want to say Amanda Crow. We, we have some very good uh, songwriters. Um, Donnie Markowitz. Uh, you know, I mean, they were just they were good songwriters, but they weren't. You know, they were being asked to write five, come up with five songs, original songs a week. I mean, you know, Lerner and Lowy didn't do five. It's just not the way musicians work. So it was defeated by that premise. But it was defeated, I think, even if you did have, uh, you know, uh, John Lennon and, and Elton John writing your music or something, you could not have done the show in that company because that group of of, of, of men and women who did the, who did Hill Street and then they did, uh, eventually they did N NYPD Blue and you know that that crew. Um, so music requires a kind of non-ironic, among other things, requires so, a non-ironic soul. I mean, you have to be able to look into the eyes of someone you love and say, I'm yours. You can't do that as a writer, as an artist. You shouldn't be writing musicals. They really, they can't all be wisecracks like this one. Um, when it works, that's fine, you know, and you should have a few of those in every, you know, great musical. But you also have to be able to to be direct and ironic, and the strength of that very gifted group of people who did such great uh, television, like a lot of the work of that generation, the one directly preceding my own TV generation, um, is marked by a sense that all great art is a little bit, you know, the, 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 all the curses of high modernism. It's always ironic. All emotions are a little bit bullshit. Um, sentimentality uh, walks with the devil. Um, you know, all the, all the things that made the, the literature of the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s great. I mean, their, their favorite uh, writer is, is J.D. Salinger. I mean, the, the world in which their sensibility was formed is a deeply ironic, um, a tearing of the veil of ordinary bourgeois society. There's a kind of a, a contempt at its heart for the kinds of emotion that I think make for better songs. I'm just speaking as, you know, you don't really kind of, kind of want to, Write a lot of songs which say, "I love you, but I gotta go now." The boys are waiting, which is sort of the, the tone of the world of Stephen okay, Bochco. So, look, so, but this is an David aesthetic. Milch. This is an aesthetic judgment, John. What I, what my question is, sort right, of more vulgar. Artist. What do you want from no, me? No, why didn't the show work with audiences? Why didn't people watch? Because they, because they want they want I love you. They want feeling. They want true. People are entitled to feel something. They don't. And you, and they don't always want to be smirking at the, uh, you know the. They're, you know, you just can't live on a, on a diet of, uh, of wisecracks. I, mean, I remember I talked to you on the telephone when you were working on this show, 
And I remember, because I was excited about something I was watching on television, I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you kept telling me, don't tell me your ideas, because I'm working on this character now. And remember, we, we actually had an argument, because uh, it was as if, it, it was as if John, <laughs> didn't want to be, didn't, John didn't want to be uh, uh, distracted from his sense that, uh, uh, that, that uh, the materials he was working with had a kind of, had a kind of uh, uh, original excitement for him that he didn't want corrupted by sort of academic discourse. And the truth is, I remember genuine intellectual excitement in you, especially about the central plot. I mean, th this show actually was a very advanced show in a lot of well, ways. Well, it had, it had a Tell, great... I mean, one of the things great... is that the, one of the protagonists is a cop who ends up going to jail. Yeah, you know? the, but, you know, but, he, but that, again, you know, it's sort of the dirty cop who had to do what he had to do and put him on the wrong side of the authorities. I mean, there's a kind of, uh, it seems to me, the, the, the informing cultural precepts of that show, and perhaps of Hill Street Blues in its way, which is a greater show, seem to me long in the tooth in a way that as an artist you always have to be conscious of. It seemed to belong to the side of um, post-war um, writing and art that sort of felt the more cynical you were, the smarter you probably were. That all great art is fundamentally ironic. ironic. Right. And that, that, that is, a, you can see that we were talking about a very successful example of a movie, which uh, I admire, and I work with Coen Brothers, but, but um, the movie uh, 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 No Country for Old Men, um, you know, embodies that. Uh, you can see how smart I am because you see how depressed and cynical and, dis and fundamentally essentially dissenting I am. Uh, now, I think that movie really is really worth seeing, <laughs> really good. And I've, you know, we, we did a movie called Intolerable Cruelty. That's an interesting, I don't know if you saw Intolerable Cruelty. You like the movie? How many saw Intolerable Cruelty? Okay. A and, um, well, good, I'm glad you like it. They made a change in the direction that I'm talking about. I mean, well, I think the problem with Intolerable Cruelty, perhaps for those who are not as excited about it, um, was that it, in it? Every, everybody in it is is kind of a bad guy. She she's as much uh, a uh, thief and liar, and and uh, uh, she's a marriage pirate. You know, she goes from marriage to marriage, stuffing her pockets as she divorces you, and she takes on the world's most talented divorce lawyer and gets him to fall in love with her on the grounds that she's uh, Catherine Zeta Jones, <laughs> um, uh, and looks great. Um, that's the device of the movie to actually, the Coen brothers are such skillful movie makers, they told the um, makeup people, we want her to look like gold. And they said, oh yeah, she'll look great. And they said, no, no, gold as in AU gold. They, we want her to look like gold. That is, we want the makeup to actually have a gold tint because she's about money. <laughs> and that's how we're going to shoot her. And suited her hair and eyes. but. That's what they did. I mean, they're incredibly meticulous filmmakers and brilliant. I'm not saying anything about that. But in, their, in my version, she was an ordinary housewife whose husband uh, left her, took her to the cleaners, um, and, uh, and she decided to get even by getting this divorce lawyer, George Clooney, to fall in love with her. And uh, she succeeds and takes his money. In their version, she too has a kind of uh, marauding career. Um, and so it was two bad guys against each other. It became, therefore, about a thousand times funnier and more entertaining than my version. And maybe it left a little less, maybe it had a little less impact, potentially, on your, feel, on your feelings than, than my version. We will never know. I loved working with them, and I think it's, you know, I'm proud of the movie. But um, uh, you'll see my credit is for story, because they went a whole other way with, with the making of the movie. And it was a similar thing and they're and they're and they're fairly you know young and 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 for, forward looking filmmakers and the same might be said of the other uh, Oscar movie this year there will be blood that it has a really uh, nasty right heart but the 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 sort of ironic sort of modernist ironic perspective that yeah. you're talking about certainly makes the argument makes great sense to me John uh, and I certainly see how it's manifested, especially in the movies, com commonly, frequently. I guess, and I, I understand how elements like this can get into television, but it seems, in fact, that such a sort of modernist and ironic perspective would not be uh, very, tele would not survive on television for very long because there's always that sort of, 
uh, claim of sentiment. There's always that claim of reassurance that at least broadcast television well, until you very know, recently. Take a, I, mean, I think Scrubs is a terrific them. show, and it wears its feelings very lightly, uh, but they're there. It has tremendous affection toward its characters. Yes. It's really I mean, fun. that's where the really sentiment comes in, isn't it? Yeah, but 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 you, but you you have to but you have to think hard before calling it sentimental. I mean, yes, but we th one thinks of Scrubs as a very late right. show, right? Whereas it, Grey's Anatomy is very happy. I mean, Grey's Anatomy is both sentimental and I think has no particular weight and no, uh, but it's certainly attractive and gives its audience a good time. So I don't think you necessarily it's, it's and 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 I and I don't. I, I think it could be a lot better. So I don't think you'd necessarily achieve great art by going the other way. And in their turn, uh, David and uh, Bochco and have created uh, really some of the, I think NYPD Blue is, is the best you can, I wasn't anywhere near that show. Um, I think it's the best you can do. I think that for me that was the great show because they really did care about Sipowitz. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that therefore they were invested beyond the, uh, the law and order of it. I mean, I, I created the show. I created a show called Sweet Justice with, with Cicely Tyson. It was on for a year, and the reason, one of the reasons I I, I created the show was I went to the Oscars um, and um, the Oscars, the Emmys, um, and uh, there, I remember seeing the, the, the clips for Best Show, and one was NYPD Blue, in which Bunce uh, takes a, a, an accused man, a perp, which means in our system. An accused, a man accused of being a criminal, which means on our system, by the way, that he's innocent, <laughs> um, in case you haven't noticed, or you're John Ashcroft. Um, it, 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 he takes a, a, an accused man and slams him into the wall, and he says, uh, uh, I'm going to get a, a migraine tonight because I can't you know, smash your forehead in right now because of the Bill of Rights or something. Uh, or something like that. And then the next clip was for Picket Fences, and it was... Um, uh, Ray Walton or somebody, I think, being a judge, and David Kelly, who's a lawyer, um, had written uh, this series, and the judge is saying, in the clip they showed, was saying, isn't it a shame the way, uh, you know, we have to let um, so many, you know, criminals go free because of technicalities? And I thought, here's a judge talking about technicalities. Well, what, what the heck else do you do as a judge but worry about whether the law is technical? Uh, you know, uh, rules have been followed exactly what, <laughs> and I thought both of these shows are being uh, uh, you know promoted and and have huge audiences, and I've enjoyed episodes of, of both. I mean, as I said, NYPD Blue, I thought spectacular show, but both of them took as a premise, you see, that what the audience wanted was that we should be slamming the accused, no matter what. So I created a show about um, um, a, a, about def uh, defense attorneys. Well, no one has really been able to make a successful show about defense attorneys. I mean, Boston Legal is uh, as good as you get. It gets, and, and Boston Legal writes those. I mean, it, no one has ever. Let me just leave it at that. No one's ever been able to to make a show about defense attorneys. And I would confront a, a, a Bochco and well, so forth. The, they had no in, sympathy in the in the last for, twenty-five years. I mean, there have been shows in the long history of television. Well, right? maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I am talking about the last twenty-five no, years. No, and in fact, I mean, it's an interesting fact that the that the medium has, in some sense, become but, more but I, corporate. But I, but I, but I, but I believe in the market to this extent. If people, if the, if there were a tremendous yearning in the audience to see someone defend criminals, and for that to be your hero. We would have had more than the few uh, examples that we have of shows that even pretend, you know, to do that. Um, it, it, so, I mean, I think the audience is at, the audience is in a very law and order mood. No doubt, your point is well taken. Nine Eleven re reinforces that, and these shows have catered to it with their own anxiety and cynicism uh, about the social fabric. And and uh, I wouldn't say they're right wing, by the way, as everyone knows. Everybody who writes in Hollywood is uh, more or less a liberal Democrat, if you can count the exceptions on one hand. You can print that well, if you look, want. This, I, I'm going to, this is the last question I'll ask, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, so prepare your questions. But, John, on the basis of something you've just said, yeah. uh, I, I was going to ask you to say a little bit about what you and I have sometimes called, and I've actually seen referred to in print as, the Yale and Harvard Mafia <laughs> of guys who write for television. I when, think the when, point is that... When you went off to, to work on television, there was already a group of... Uh, of uh, Former Yale graduates who were working in television. That was how you got the. That was your contact. Yeah, talk, I looked talk up a people bit I know it, talk, yeah. a, talk a, a little bit about. I, I think the only, the, the only, the, aside from the sort of bula bula of it, the only thing of it that's uh, important about it is the following: 
that TV is made by um, dropout English majors um, from good universities, not necessarily Harvard and Yale only, and that the, it, 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 it's, it, there is a, when I got into it in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a literary inheritance uh, which was always present. I mean, you know, it can be it can be overwhelming sometimes. I mean, I remember you know walking down the hallway at MTM, the old studio that produced Saint Elsewhere and Remington Steele and Hill Street Blues and all. And they'd say, "Let's do Stephen Crane's The Blue Hotel." Only we'll use our characters, and and everyone knew what he was talking about more or less. I mean, you know, you know that was very surprising. I think that ship has sailed. I think now you have a generation of really good, really smart, really talented young filmmakers who for reasons of their own, actually prefer TV to movies, but their origins, the, the, the pictures in their head derive from movies, from television, from graphic media, uh, different kinds. They're not originally, they're certainly not playwrights. Nobody goes to the theater. And they're, I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the kinds of numbers, masses that, that you need to produce a popular culture. Um, and What's become of reading is a, a well familiar story, I, I should think. I mean, so the, 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 their, the, um, their, their sensibilities are not founded on texts, are not founded on language. It's all, it already comes in visualized form. That being said, boy, are they talented. Boy, are they cool. Um, boy, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff being done. But there is, for me, that will always seem to me to be some, it's a little harder for me to get at the, some of the interesting wrinkles of, of this, this uh, humanoid crowd um, if you don't have access to language um, and if words aren't in cent centrally in play in your drama. Um, and um, that doesn't mean that all television has to look like in treatment, which is a camera that goes back and forth between two talking people. Terrific show. Um, but it does mean that, that basically, you know, take away the word um, and there's just not much you can say about these, uh, these uh, uh, bipeds that will really claim me as an artist, inspire me. That, but, it, but the truth is that these, a lot of these young filmmakers are not, they're not devoid of language. They just, it's just like the language already comes in visual form. It's already moving. They're already moving pictures. I suspect there are limits to what that's going to, that, that direction is going to be able to say or achieve. But remember that Henry V begins with Shakespeare saying, oh, for a stage of, what is a ring of fire? Oh, the first thing he calls for is, get me out of this little box where all I can do is talk. I want, he's asking for cranes, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, shots that like the one in Atonement that goes all around like through four cities and ends up in his nose. I mean, uh, he's, you know, there's, there are limits to what you can do with just words, and artists and writers have always felt it and gestured uh, toward it, and so uh, uh, the new generation has it. Um, and you want to, you, you know, you want to welcome that, but I think that, that as the word, so, I mean, in the answer, your answer to your question about the Yale Mafia or Harvard Mafia, what, you, what you're saying is that there's a, it was the generation that made the great television of the, of the 80s and 90s was, looking back, was surprisingly well-educated. And every now and then, the New York Times would run a piece uh, saying, look it, there's a person there who writes for television who actually knows how to read and write uh, and went to college once. It would, it would always be shocking, you know, to people. I think that's, uh, you know, people know that you come out of, 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 of Brown and MIT and so forth, um, having watched and absorbed a lot of uh, internet uh, webisodes and television, uh, maybe even more than uh, novels by Balzac, uh, and yet you're, um, you're, you're going to be creative and you're going to tell interesting stories. But I think there is some, there, there may be some uh, leakage in what we can accomplish when we're no longer a logocentric, uh, I mean, I, that, that, is that just an old fogey, I think? Maybe, but uh, that one, one, I think one would certainly, I think one could certainly say that recent television is less verbal than it used to be, less psychological, more oriented toward action in ways that confirm what you're saying. Well, it also, it's also image mad. I mean, th that's really, because, I mean, Deadwood is a very verbal show. There are speeches in Deadwood that must go three pages. 
Um, the, uh, and yet, you don't necessarily, I would not call it character centered. I would call it's very interested in image making and, and kind of myth making. It's basically a, a very uh, uh, logoreographic novel. It's not actually novelistic, it's not literary or dramatic the way we're talking about. What's a po really positive example? Juno. Juno seems to me in the great literary tradition. That's depressing to hear. No, no, I think Juno is. I think Juno is, comes right out of Jane Austen or something, with, with, without blinking. I mean, Juno seems to me a great... Uh, it, it's not as good as Lars and the Real Girl, but it's close. I would say Lars and the Real Girl is the best script I've read in the last uh, seven or eight years. And to tell you the truth, I didn't see the movie. I just read the script. She was a TV writer on Six Feet Under, terribly literary show with real characters and a total and a completely absurd premise that you would have... If you were a betting person, you would have been well advised to bet against the success of a show set in a funeral parlor. Um, and yet, uh, look at the pleasure it gave and look at how much it ended up saying about human beings and life. But of course, and it, one was, of its it writers. was a cable show, though. It was a yes, that, that, well, that, that, the it, let, it was let that be the HBO last show. thing we it say. Is, is it I, would never have been, been on the network. As I said before, when you have something that's fundamentally people-centered and is going to have to use language a lot, you go to HBO. Um, for instance, and that would be an example of why. But it's no surprise that, that, that a writer on Six Feet Under ends up writing a wonderful script like Lars and the Real Girl. Um, it, it's, it's, it's less surprising the fact that a stripper ends up writing uh, Juno. <laughs> but um, th those are marvelous writers. That's a very exciting uh, generation of, uh, of, of women writers. We got some interesting uh, shows ahead. It's as good as a squid and the whale is bad. It's your turn. We we have some we have a clip in reserve which which I could show but I, I'm 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 holding it in case the dis discourse requires it. The reason it, we should go to questions is oh. that the media comes at you, right. and now you get to come back a little okay. bit. It would be helpful to identify yourselves when you come to the microphone since this is being recorded for posterity. <clears throat> uh, hi there, I'm uh, Tom Balovic, and I'm a media theorist, enjoying this. Uh, so I have a, a question uh, in reference to um, television content over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And my question is, given the <clears throat> uh, rich spectrum of, of human drama that's available, um, I, I've always tended to think of uh, cops and robbers as kind of a least common denominator approach to that content. So my question, I guess, is, is, is the obsession with, with cops and robbers and crime drama, is that a, a feature or function uh, associated with the television industry or uh, their obsession with it, um, the audience's obsession with it, or some combination of, of between the two? Well, I think it's probably hardwired into the human um, being, this obsession with Cops and robbers, if by that you mean dramas that essentially turn on the question of whether you're raking the law or not. Um, Antigone is centrally about that. Um, you'd be raking the law, burying your brother there. Um, that's okay. I guess I'm a criminal. Well, I'm a cop, says Creon, and uh, we got a show to do. So that's, a cop, that's, the, that's the first cop show in my imagination. When I was a student of literature um, in, uh, uh, and... Um, Maybe we should David identify Thorburn. Antigone for these people. David I, Thorburn was... Don't you. No, now you're not going to interrupt me. No, for young professor David Thorburn uh, was giving a lecture, and he said, and we were all students of... Uh, I mean, you know, the fashionable topics were theory, the fashionable topics were Rousseau, we were like, you know, and, and the poetry of uh, Wallace Stevens. That was that moment, it was the 70s, in literary theory. And... Um, David uh, gave a lecture, Professor Thorburn gave a lecture that said, a cop is a really interesting person. Now, he's speaking to an audience who didn't think so. Cops, the other word for cop was pig, and we were sure that they weren't very interesting, at least not the ones that we had passed on the way to school that morning. And he said, no, a cop stands at a windy juncture of, uh, you know, my little rewriting here, windy corner uh, where straight society and the element that threatens it, and poor people and people who prey on poor people, it stands at the juncture of social forces, economic forces, social forces. It stands in a sort of Hobbesian 
cutting edge, that person. And he has to live a life. He has to come home to his family. He has to be a person. He said, it's interesting that our novelists, our fiction writers at the time, that was conjured the name Donald Bartholomew or something, um, are not interested in a figure like that. But if you go back 100 years, Balzac writes about cops. Dickens writes Inspector Bucket. Dostoevsky creates Stavrogin in, in Crime and Punishment. In other words, the great foundational works of narrative fiction found cops very interesting and saw their social, the odd social place they occupy as perfect for a kind of narrative exploration of, our, of the social contract, of our deepest issues, while our novelists are now piveling off in the direction of Donald Bartholomew or, excuse me, Sylvia Plath. And, and that, that thing was so alarming and reactionary and interesting that many of us became cop show writers. Uh, not in direct causation, but it, stayed, it, it occurred to me very often, and I knew it was true, at least of Dickens. So I'm, what I'm saying is that, that, that it, the real question is not why so many people watch Cops and Robbers, is what else is there to really write about, not other than Cops and Robbers, but the fundamental question of right and wrong in society, how we can stand living with each other, how can we get the good of living with each other, and what medium more... Um, it's like life, and when, you write, when you're writing a medical show, unless you're stealing uh, money, what you're doing is you're, you're supposed to be writing about life and death, so that if instead you're just stealing hugs in the hallway, like on Grey's Anatomy, I think you're letting down our, our trust. But life, for, for medical shows, read life and death. For cops and robbers, read, uh, read uh, Hobbes' Leviathan. For you know, any of these genres, there's a reason we keep, we, we, that's what's hitting, that's the, that's the pressure of thought. Uh, that's hitting them at an angle if you're any good at it and if the show is any good. So I don't think they need much defending. Most of them are terrible. Most cop shows are terrible, in spite of everything I can, yeah, every well, illusion I can dredge I mean, one, one further thing from an academic or, or historical perspective to say about these genre forms is that they're partly because they're so stable, the, the genre begins, the beginning of television continues as one of its dominant genres, not its only genre, but one of its dominant story forms. It's a, it, ma it makes the cop show an incredibly interesting window on, 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 on American uh, social history because you can see over the course of the, uh, of the history of television the movement from Dragnet in the 1950s to, show, to, to uh, various shows in the, uh, in, the, in the 60s culminating at the end of the 60s in a series of cop shows that show much greater sympathy. I mean, the culture was bifurcated, right? It was the time of the Vietnam War and, and generation, generational conflict. Uh, and the cop shows reflected that. And they showed a, the cop shows of the late 60s and early 70s through Hill Street Blues in 1980, which begins in 1980, are shows that show a much greater sympathy for the criminals and a much greater sympathy for the victims of crime, have a much more complex attitude toward... Well, complex the, rather the social, than sympathy for the, the social criminal. Pa yes, the social pathology of crime becomes a subject. Uh, and then I think what you can actually see as the country itself becomes more conservative and uh, in the Reagan years, you can see cop shows constricting again, going back to being much simpler kinds of morality plays in which the cops well, stand. Well, well, back to my original point, though. The threats that, the threats that, 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 you know, there's such a thing as being a reactionary. The threats that cause reaction also have to be taken seriously. If you're a good writer, you want to walk a line between acknowledging what people are afraid of that drive reaction and noting their reactionary quality. But when you're doing CSI and you're only interested in how with one strand of hair we can find you, even if you're in, uh, in New Zealand, um, then, then, you're, then you're, you're imagining that there, are, that there are simple solutions to complex problems and the heck with you. So, next question. Oh, sorry. I just finished a huge paper on the CSI effect. Oh, okay. um, but another thing that I noticed when I was writing this is um, the theme that late night TV mm. seems to really um, be about things that are dangerous and fearful, almost like fairy tales. Um, when you, mean, when you say late night TV. Uh, well, I have insomnia, so. <laughs> um, there's a lot of shows on, you know, after 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, that um, tend to be about um, medical mysteries, or oh. you know, this could happen to you type of things, oh. or um, America's Most Wanted, true crime, you know, predatory type behaviors. And yeah. I'm thinking, you know, this is the last thing you want to see before you sleep, but yet, maybe you could explain that. Why they're on so? Why they're on so late? 
<laughs> yeah, why that theme is so prevalent in late night TV. I think, I think there's a, just a voyeurism and a pornography to it that's just un, unbelievable. And the thing about it that I would say to whoever um, makes those shows, I mean, I, you know, it's not the same group. They're not, they're not really writer driven. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're documentary filmmakers um, and they're uh, sort of slumming most of them. I know what you mean. Like the ta even HBO had one, the Taxi Stories. Was that you ever see that one? Yeah. Taxi Diaries. Taxi Diaries. Is that it? Isn't it? Uh, the thing about it is that there'll always be, you know, there'll always be, an, you know, the walls of Pompeii. There'll always be an appetite for that kind of, and I think it's preying on people's late night fears. And under the guise of telling the truth and getting at reality, they're just titillating our our most worst sort of 4 a.m. sleepless. Um, anxieties. They're not saying anything about those things. They're just saying, you know what they're kind of saying? They're kind of saying, ooh. <laughs> That's what they're saying. That's all they have to say. Look at this. And, and, and all those uh, fake, uh, uh, those cop shows, which are just the camera following arrests and domestic break-ins. And, you know, they're just giving people a kind of vicarious thrill. And, the, and my warning to anyone who's uh, putting, uh, putting their money behind such shows is that the Internet's doing it way better and that we can't. There's no way we can compete. You know, we used to say about violence. On, I mean, we used to pride ourselves on Hill Street and how bad we did the action sequences because we just didn't care about them and we weren't very good at them. And how do you write them anyway? And t the thing that kept us honest was that um, movies just did them so much better. You know, you know, how can you compete with the explosiveness of a diehard? to name a really exciting example. You can't compete with that on TV, so don't even try. And I would say to these, to that kind of TV, you, I think your, your instincts about what's creating it is correct. correct there. And um, they're not very soothing, is that you cannot keep up with what the internet is, is about to provide, is now providing. Um, so I think, therefore, they're doomed. That's a case where the technological wars mean TV will lose. Because no matter what, how permissive the FCC gets, they're never going to permit some of the stuff you could find if you type in the right sick little combination of words on your search engine. God help us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Stephen Brennan. I work in the advertising industry. I'd like to, uh, you, you touched on royalties uh, briefly earlier. Mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of bring, back, bring us back to that. You know, I, I think about, I think about royalties, and I, I also think about you know uh, libraries a little bit, and I wonder, you know, when the libraries are just sort of starting to understand the the role the internet plays in, in their ability to sort of bring the library from a physical building out into the home. I know the Boston Public Library is working through many initiatives to sort of a uh, sort of decentralize the library and decentralize their collection. And I also look at you know BitTorrent, for example, and the recent statistics I've been reading are 80% of the traffic on BitTorrent are actually television programs. So I sort of look at this uh, spontaneous library of television programming, which is sort of, you know, there's an enormous demand and appetite. And obviously, it's illegal, I think, by any standards that the writers would certainly look at. And I remember as a child, I'd go to the library, and we'd get videotapes, and we'd go home, and we'd watch them, and we'd bring them back. Mm -hmm. And do you think that down the road, the royalty issue will sort of inhibit li the library's ability to deliver digital content? You know, how do you see that playing out sort of down the road? I mean, obviously, writers need to make money, and it's not just writers, obviously, that have a financial interest. But, you know, even today, we can go and take out books and such from yeah. the library. And, 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 you know, I'd just like to get your comments and you know, what yeah. you think about I mean, that. Yeah, I mean, I hope future. you're not too disappointed. I don't have strong or interesting views on this. I mean, I know that I know there's an unpredictable, a lot of unpredictable aspects to the media explosion, the types and kinds of of archiving and library availabilities. And I don't think anyone can uh, predict right now what's the best arrangement. Look, let me make the opposite case from the one I made before, because as I say, I don't have uh, religious views on this. Um, I like the studios and networks wanting to be in the um, dramatic television business and the, and the business of making movies that are about human beings instead of Transformers. I like studios and networks to think there's money to be made there. And I don't want to, to use the jargon, disincentivize an executive who's considering a project by taking away the little pennies he thinks he might make in the, by selling it in some media that I can't even conceive of or pronounce. So I, 
I, I think there's, I'm, I'm in no huge hurry to figure out contractually how even if they invent a way of, you know, watching my show on your fingernail or something, um, I, I will get money, pennies out of it. I, I, don't, I don't need to spend any time doing that. We, but everybody in this room knows that the Internet is a place to watch TV episodes, or you, you'll soon know. Your kids, your kids will tell you. Um, and so that one we know that there must be advertising dollars. That's what it comes to. Uh, getting getting spent on those internet rebroadcasts. So how about you know sh cutting that very big pie, or if it's a little pie, cutting that very little pie, and, that, and that's all. That's as far as I can go. I can't. And by the way, I, I, it's true. A authors don't get royalties when I take th your book out of the library, and no one's screaming that this is a, uh, a, a, a you know a moral uh, uh, nefarious. So. Uh. Uh, Mr. Romano. Uh, my name is David Sheets, and I'm an undergraduate here at MIT, and I'm wondering about um, two, I guess, related, uh, in my mind, relatively recent uh, things that have occurred. It's related to the TV show Dexter on Showtime, yeah. which is a cop and robber show, as you mentioned, yeah. um, and it's regarding the layout of the show, how the show is no longer metered and fed to the audience episodically, weekly. Like you mentioned, you can view it on DVD. In fact, uh, many people that I talk to only view their shows on the internet or on DVD. How do you think that's going to change the writing of these shows, particularly shows that are very traditional forms like Cops and Robbers, where you now have these very intricate, you know, multi-hour video storylines like in, in the show Dexter, uh, that you have to keep the entire show in your mind simultaneously to understand? Well, I think that, I mean, I think that's very exciting. I think, you know, that narrative has, well, two things. One, I still think the most um, adventurous thing about Dexter which is a, a, a good show, is that it's from the point of view of a serial killer. I mean, it's hard. Once, you, once that's, you've decided to cross that Rubicon, I think you're already in you know, strange territory. And, and um, it's very good. They do a good job. They, it makes sense to me, the show. It makes moral sense to me. It makes sense to me. Macbeth is about, has, stars a, uh, a, 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 a killer and indeed a serial killer. Um, but... As for what you're saying about the fact that they're breaking it up and webbing it out and all that, and how does it affect the writing of it, I think that we're trying to, we're trying to keep up um, and trying to figure it out. I'm not on that show, obviously, but I'm sure they're trying to figure out how to, are there three-minute version, are there three-minute scenes which will get people to watch the whole hour, are there, here's one thing that's very tempting, um, which is there's a great scene to be had, let's say, with the mother of the victim, but there's really no room in the hour for that scene. We want the hour to move, 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 move. So if you go on to our website and click on her little head, you'll see the scene that she plays out with the investigating uh, uh, investigator, what's her name? Um, and, and we didn't have room for it in the show. And then from that, it's a short step to let's shoot some scenes, which are not going to be in the hour, that are now going to be available online. So if you're really, if you can't get enough of loss like these three guys, you can go online and see, you know, what's her name when she goes back to her tent or something. You can, you can follow rivulets off the main, <laughs> and we're writing them and providing them. And the nice thing is they don't have to be any given length. They don't have to be, I mean, there's a, um, that's very tempting to a writer. I mean, you know, we like to write, give us anything, you know. And the one minutes of, uh, of 24, um, those are cut from the body. But it's very easy to shoot a, a few more. And, you know, we used to, the first place it appeared, I remember they gave the, uh, uh, Coppola did the uh, deluxe pack of The Godfather, and he included scenes of the family, which were not in any version, including his cut. It's not like the director's cut. It's stuff that he had left on the cutting room floor. Well, now you're going to start making those scenes and writing those scenes, and sometimes they'll include clues for the ongoing story of the series as a whole. So you're inviting the audience to play with you. Fun, fun, fun. And my reaction is that it's fun. I mean, a, fur a, a further sort of theoretical implication is that it continues a process that the literary scholars have been talking about for almost half a century now, which is uh, the, what they call the destabilization of the text. Where, what is the text? It is, a, is, it, is it the hour that's broadcast? It is, is, it, is, is it the director's cut that's reduced? Le that, or is it the, is it the DVD? There, there are so many uh, venues in which, in which these stories can now be experienced that it's, that it's fundamentally altering the landscape of, of, of this form of narrative. And I think that uh, it's a profound question. And I think John's answer about how this is tempting tells us how yeah. writers are going to begin to exploit 
these new possibilities. But I th my, there's, one th there's one caveat that I think is crucial, which is that we live in an era where platforms go obsolete with f five minutes after they're introduced, and that is the problem. In other words, if, if there were some stability, if we could be sure that a particular delivery system would last more than five years, we might have some confidence that very rich forms of narrative would develop. But because we're not sure about this, some of these Here uh, comes experiments are going. Right. That's right. Some of these experiments are going to be are going to be uh, disappointed because the platform they are conceived for w won't be viable. But in general, we're clearly in an immensely destabilized moment in, in the in the history of audiovisual storytelling. And what John's uh, just said about it is just a hint of what 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 I think will will, will follow. Hi, my name's Whitney. I'm a first year CMS graduate student. Uh, I'm really interested in the fact that you have a background in Dickens and you've talked a lot about the relationship between literature and television writing and sentimentality, of course Dickens being a great sentimental writer. Um, I'm also interested in the relationship between, of course Dickens was also a great writer of serial texts and wrote in process. Uh, uh, he would write serials as, you know, one at a time on a monthly basis. And I'm curious uh, if you see any relationships between that and television writing. It's something that I've seen some Victorian scholars hint at, but not they haven't really fleshed out a, a, a relationship that might exist yeah, between the popularity yeah. of both narratives. A actually, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, it's a question I like a lot, feeling as I do about Dickens, and it's a very good question about the form of television, because I think that's where it was predicted in some way, was, was the weekly, not only monthly, but weekly, serialization in some of the no, Victorian novels, not just Dickens, he's the one we remember. And not only that, but they would go home, you know, they'd appear, you'd buy, buy a copy, bring, home, bring it home, and read it to the family in the living room, just where we have the TV now. <laughs> and not only that, but it came with commercials. Our advertiser friend would be happy. I mean, the, the, if you look at a serial weekly, uh, it had ads around the side, you know, for powders and whatever they sold, and, 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 and so it came with commercials. Um, and also Dickens watched the sales of his story, and if things were not going well with the sales of a given book, like we might watch Nielsen's, he might just introduce a new character, he might change the direction of his story, and he watched them like a hog. And Martin Chuzzlewit, he's, he, he, the people started for the first time not to uh, read his, his new book in the same numbers he was used to, and he noticed that a lot of bestsellers were about voyages to America. And so he suddenly sent his characters off to America, um, and sales picked up, and he brought them home and finished the original narrative, um, which is just what a good Hollywood producer might do. You know, this is really working on some other show. We should have, you know, a, uh, I don't know, gay cop or whatever. So there's a kind of a, a, a appetite for the audience, which drives the artistic imagination in the same way, as well as these really exact parallels that you're pointing to, such as weekly civilization. But the profoundest link is the one you began with, the sentimentality and so forth. This is really a middle class writer writing to the heart of the middle class when that wasn't a bad word. And the emotions of family and um, the drama, as you saw in that clip, of very ordinary human lives. You know, everybody who's got a teenage daughter or is one gets it. Um, and uh, that was fodder for his imagination and the Victorian imagination, and it still plays like mad, you know. So that, yeah, the Dickens, it was a very appropriate background. Um, I would have been a different TV writer if I'd come out of uh, Flaubert or something, <laughs> I guess. You know, I like, I, I like uh, the question. And the intimacy, you know, your question about late night is there's a, there's a very private relation between reader and text alone in bed at 2 a.m. That's not the relation at eight an 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock TV show. When you're watching with your kids, you're always told to watch with your children. When you're eating in front of the TV so the communal meal becomes. But the relationship between you and the TV set, at 3 a.m., you're probably watching alone. Um, and these days, you might even be watching with, the, with it on your lap in the world of laptops. And, and I think there's, it's, it's, so it draws closer to that other the solitary relation of the reader. And the, the 19th century novel had already moved away from that to a kind of more public uh, uh, engagement. But that's one thing that's going on with late night, isn't it? It reminds me of, of listening as a kid to radio shows 
and uh, by putting, you know, putting the radio under my pillow and listening to a voice late at night. Now TV is there, whereas TV stations in those days had signed off with the American flag at around 10.30, as I recall. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Wesley Foster. I'm a computer engineer. And has anyone realized that the function of video is to make hardware more marketable? Is what? <laughs> the function of video is to make hardware more marketable? <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't tell me about that. <laughs> well, Microsoft sp sells most of its units directly to the actual factory and just charges them a licensing fee. In other words, if they get sued by a, uh, a legal body that wants to extort money out of them, they just simply get rid of the retail version. And they sit there and say, okay, now you can buy it from the Japanese and you can pay somebody to take it off. And it's your problem, not mine. <laughs> and up until uh, Linux or the EEPC, you couldn't really market a piece, uh, PC without a Windows operating system on it. So the function, the model for the uh, engineering community in computer en engineering is that without the actual Windows operating system, the PC is unmarketable as okay. a mass-produced device. So the object of our industry is to reduce the cost of memory to the point where we can first market audio, which we've done with Napster and so on, and then lower it further by marketing video. So the logical aspiration for our industry is to take video, put it onto a notebook PC at the factory, and use the program on the PC to make the PC marketable. Because the profit level is so much higher than the actual hardware, because you have to write a piece of software once, and then you can market it millions of times that comparing the actual product alone sold on a, on a CD or a DVD is unprofitable. You might as well just shove it on the actual PC at the factory. Has anybody in the industry realized that? Yeah, I mean, it's the kind, well, I say yes, I don't even know, I hardly know what you're talking about, but the truth is that, <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't mean it satirically. What I mean is I, I do not know how close such a development would be or how it would look. But I can say yes to this extent. It sounds like very bad news. I could say yes to this extent. We are terrified about the kind of thing you're talking about. Are we correct to be terrified? In your opinion, it sounds like we should be. Uh, it means your market's going to get wider, not, uh, not more narrow. If I would be yes. worried, if yes, I was worried I mean. about it, I would be the executive who was worried at, at NBC. Because if I was the head of the union during the union negotiations, I would have gone to the Chinese and say, can you make a player so I can circumvent NBC and have all of my union members produce content for your device instead of an actual television set? Well, if I understand you correctly, though, I should be terrified, too. <laughs> because if, 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 if people are going to buy a PC that already has all my movies, 22 episodes of my favorite show or whatever, once and forever they bought that, they'll never get through what they have on their hard drive, I imagine, in their lifetime, right? then they never have to go to the store and buy the DVD of any of those things, and I'll never see um, any profit, royalty, participation, or residuals because they bought it. If I understand you, it's why I, I confess my ignorance up front, but if I understand you, it's already in there. It's already in the PC that I buy. So why would that person ever have to go to a store or a theater to see anything that, 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 that you or I might write? end up happening is you end up with well-written shows that have a very large market internationally available. And I think if you talk to That's the cast good. of Star Trek, I think they're probably pretty pleased with their reaction. That's pretty good. You know what I pictured <laughs> when you told me about it, uh, again, w without having quite the ability to understand? Uh, there's that collection of Janus films, which is 250 CDs you can buy, which are all the great foreign films that were marketed here in the 60s and 70s. And it's very heavy and very expensive, more expensive than my wife intends to spend on me at Christmas. And I imagine that what you're saying, you could buy someday you, that'll just be on somebody's hard drive as a little, a little attractive little perk of buying the thing. And those films will be available, you know, the way it's very hard to find them or buy them now. So it's, yeah, it's good for the consumer and good for, yeah, and maybe, maybe even, I mean, yeah, the shelf life is good. Um, we'll see. It's so far beyond. It's so not what we do. It's so far beyond imagination. We know just enough to be afraid, and that's hard, what I'm trying to convey. To, it's hard to take this as a serious business model, 
uh, because <laughs> since the since the computer is a system that can communicate with anyone, uh, it makes more sense to think of it as a, as a device that would allow people to buy many stories from many di many different sources. But he's sort of saying you'll never have to. But again. but I mean, if the idea is that the, that you can buy every audiovisual story in the history of the universe on a single CD, that's a different matter. But I assume that even if that were true, they put it would be put up someplace on the net, and you could go and download what you wanted. Right? It makes much more sense than that every individual in the universe should own every story ever written in the universe. I mean, in other words, it's hard for me to see why one would ignore the. PC's communication power, its power to, to reach no, out. I'm going to be telling using, people that you uh, about this but it's very eventuality, and well, they won't like just it. Just so you know, yeah. you have your cell phone sitting in front of you. Right. Uh, if you look at the cost of that and apply the standard business model, that device is going to cost you $4,000 over a four-year period. That is more expensive than every PC that most of us will own. And unfortunately, there's nothing in it that is even significant enough to go on your resume. It is a device that's going to be used for marketing something. The, yeah. aim, the aim for our computer industry is to market video. We're going to be looking for video to market. Our compact flash cards are about to hit 32 gigs on the market. There's 64 gigs on the way. The SSD drive is available, although hideously overpriced. Our hard drive and, and costs are dropping. And you're saying the one implication is that bandwidth won't be uh, won't catch up enough so that you could so, so that Cheap the amount storage. of downloading you could do wouldn't be enough to match what you could get. The object of the industry is to lower the cost of memory. That I get. A lot of it is done by simply wasting a lot of it. We'll have to come but up Microsoft with new stuff product that you don't have. It's specifically there yet. designed not to use it very well right. and occasionally screw up. Yes. We build IBM mainframes. An IBM mainframe tests and uses everything in it exactly. And we'll give you error reports on what's broken in it. Eventually, we'll get to that in a cell phone. But first, we've got to get the cost of memory down. To do that, we need you to produce video. <laughs> so we're going to need good writing. We're going to need video production. Don't think of TV as your only market. Oh, yeah. I, yeah that, 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 that's a, that is the good news. And you have to understand, when I graduated from college in 1999, I was allowed 12 megs on a Unix server. That was it. That's the space of three MP3s. The cards nowadays are 2,000 times that size. I can okay. walk in, put my credit card down, and walk out with it. Thanks. My professors never dreamed that would be possible. Hi, I, I'm Anna, a first-year student at CMS. Uh, at what? CMS, Comparative Media Studies. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to know how you've dealt with product placement and how you've seen it evolve, because I think it's... I had an intense question. experience with it, because uh, the last show where I was just a consultant, I sort of mostly more in movies than in TV now. It comes up in movies, but... Um, it would never reach down to the level, level of the mere writer. But in TV, we had, uh, in American Dreams, the, we had a very aggressive executive producer who was keeping, it, keeping the show on the air by going directly to Ford and, uh, and uh, General Mills. Uh, and you know we'd be pouring that cereal. We'd be driving those cars. And you'd write it right into the text. And somehow you'd find a way of saying the product name. And I found it really boring. Um, to have to do that. But you know what? People do say um, product names sometimes, so I guess it's not beyond the capacity of a writer to work it in there. You don't want, you, you got enough to think about without worrying about, without having to reference the, uh, you know, Captain Crunch, but it's, you know, but it's present, it's there. I, is it more prevalent now, John? Well, yeah, sure. Every, everything that involves uh, ways of affording television shows is more prevalent now. In movies, it's really buried. It's, in movies, it's still, thank goodness, I think, in the realm of what, what things are on the shelf in the kitchen, you know, behind Harrison Ford's head. Um, it, it's still a matter of uh, things you see that you may not be paying attention. I haven't heard anyone say, that's a swell Chevrolet you're driving there, uh, Harrison. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, you, when you start hearing that, you know that it's reached uh, movies, too. But it, it's not something writers like. 
to find themselves doing, and it is real. But you know what? Uh, well, corporate John, every corporate time America I, has been very good to, every to time television see, and movies. John, every time I see an, an Apple computer on television, I yeah. wonder if Apple has paid for the. Well, I mean, but the truth is, that there you're limited. I mean, I'm sitting here, I can see t two Apple computers. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's like, I always, I mean, I don't smoke. I've never smoked, but I hated like heck being told that my characters can't smoke. There are certain people who are going to smoke. Your job is, you're a night watchman in a bank in downtown Boston, you know, and you walk around the block all night. You're a fool not to smoke. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and the idea that, so, I mean, I, I've never liked being told any of that stuff. It makes, I understand it. People die of emphysema. I shouldn't sound this way, but you don't want, you know, as a writer, you, you imagine things, you see things, you'd love to see them on the screen. Um, well, maybe what we'll do now is we have a, a, a few minutes left, about 15 minutes left. Maybe what I'll do is the, there was a clip I was withholding. I think we'll show a clip uh, and have John make a quick comment about it. What is the, this? This is a scene from Hill Street Blues. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, Sid trying to persuade uh, Buns to. Uh, the, 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 the scene is between a snitch and a cop. Can we do third watch again? Uh, uh, wait, 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 it's too long. All right. Mom asks nice. Honey gets money. Okay, Bobby, what do you it says here in plumbing supply. You can you, can you stop it a second, Len? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess you have to explain what we're looking at. Come in the light, John, so they can see you. Um, this scene, which I don't know where David gets these scenes, but um, this scene was from the first episode of the last season of Hill Street. And in, it's about two scenes into this episode. What has happened is that a plane has crashed in the, um, in, in the, in the bad part of town. And... Uh, as the as an, a, a, a small passenger, a small private plane, and as the cops have cleared it out, um, a snitch, an informant for the police, has grabbed a suitcase which seemed to have fallen out of the debris of the plane and run like mad. And he goes to Dennis Franz, one of the great people you'll ever work with or know, and he's the informant for the detective Bunce, the, the, and he's telling him that he may know something about where that suitcase is, um, which, who, which everyone is, of course, looking for in the city, the imaginary city where Hell Street Blues take place. So we've just seen the plane crash. We saw a hand grab the suitcase and somebody run. And then we're in the bar uh, with uh, Detective Bunce, who's a cop, and his informant, Sid, on the left. They put 25 Gs up each nostril. That's a curse. Can't tell you how many lives I've seen it ruined. Trying to get business back on its feet again. Banks don't want to hear about it. Here comes the snitch. That's our niche, Norm. That's what we do. Uh, Tommy, I think you better get out of here. What's the I think he may be hot. Are you kidding? I'll start you for 10. We get two points a week. Extra to every month you're outstanding. Right, okay. He knows how to get a hold of me. I get a pop because of you. I'm going to feed your freaking eyes. Okay. Bobby, can you make it happen for me, Sid? Wait where we said. I'm going to see what I can do. Excuse me. Yeah. Since when did you get to be captain on this tour cruise, huh? No, I'm... Go, Bobby. Uh. Crazy, am I right, Norm? I just blow our connect with a shy that I'm trying to set you up with, what? Three weeks now? And now, Norm, I'm laying hands on you. So this is how you gotta know. What has come into our lives, Norm, is so big. It's so powerful, Norm. Or else I don't take the shot. Tell me about the suitcase. Did you see that suitcase? Yes. Did you see the way that kid was bent over with a weight of that thing? Do you know what was in it? Soda, Norm. <laughs> Uncut. Wreck from an air disaster. And not a pound, Norm. Which a pound uncut. Streets for 20, 22, 5. But it's not a pound, Norm. 
and it's not 10 pounds, Norm, which 10 pounds, conservative, moves at a deuce in six figures and gets two people more. And it is stinking rat hole and set up by any water we could think of. And not domestic water, Norm. Did I say domestic water? Because it doesn't have to be domestic water, Norm. We could set up by any water in the whole stinking world. And it's not 10 pounds, Norm. That's not the amount. And it's not 20 pounds, Norm. Which 20 pounds, Norm, gets broads and limousines and a house anywhere you could think of. And not 40 pounds. Not even 60 pounds, Norm, which is three quarters of a million dollars. Norm, 80 pounds. 80 pounds, Norm. That kid's intestines were down in his testicles with a way of that suitcase. Norm, I am going to ask you a question once. And I don't think you would respect me as a man if I didn't. That Bobby, he's a mouse. He is looking to off this stuff for high four figures, 7,500, 10 grand max. 10 grand. And knowing the kind of person you are, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't have that in a bank account somewhere, am I right? And that Bobby is out of the picture. And you and me, Norm, are struggling like this with that suitcase between us. I know that you are in law enforcement, but I'm asking you as a human being, to consider the possibility of an entire fresh concept and start in life. Hmm? Okay, Norm, I'm going to take my hand away from your lips now. <laughs> it would mean, Norm, so much to me if you gave me some positive indication that you would consider what I am suggesting. Is there a glimmer, Norm? Is there any possibility? None. None in the, in the sense of what? None. <laughs> okay, man. <Lord>. Meaning? <laughs> come and come. To, uh, what I was hoping you might do, John, is come in, in a sort of general way on the, the well, tone of the scene. and I don't know. Two guys. Uh, this was written by two guys who don't look terribly unlike the, these two guys, um, you know, 20 years ago. And we're just sitting in a French restaurant um, where we had lunch every day while doing Hill Street Blues. And, and just we were like saying, maybe he says to him, maybe we keep the suitcase. And then it went from there to like, well, don't answer right away, but maybe we keep the suitcase. And then it went to, now, I'm going to ask you a question, and just started building. And we were on the floor by the time we were done, you know, coming up with, uh, <laughs> I'm going to take my hands away now. I, I, and I didn't, you wouldn't respect, the line we thought was funniest is, you wouldn't respect me if I didn't at least ask. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're laugh. we're making ourselves crazy with laughing. And then we go back and type it up. What do you want to know? Well, one thing I thought you might comment on is, is uh, the relationship between the cop and his shrink, and, and, his, and, his, and his, his shrink, and his snitch. I've been thinking about in treatment, and his snitch. Because it's obviously, this is obviously a complex friendship, isn't it? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, if you, any of you know anything about this kind of law enforcement, the relation, informants are very, the relationship between informants and detectives are, is very, um, steep moral and psychological territory. You know, you, you're clearly choosing someone who's up to his ears in crime or her, and you owe a responsibility to protect them, but they also owe you a great deal for not doing what you can do, um, which is, you know, arrest them or something. So there's a kind of sense in which we both have each other at each other's mercy and you, but you are fundamentally a cop, and I am fundamentally a criminal. And uh, there's that, and the, the, we built over the years a relationship between these two, which was an especially um, knotted and, and kind of mutually affectionate. They resemble each other, but they don't, and they live together. I mean, I'm sure that uh, queer theory would have a ball with the sort of homoerotic overtones. They live together. They love each other. Um, uh, 
I remember I wrote the last episode of Hill Street Blues, co-wrote, and um, there's a scene which is the next to last episode, a uh, next to last scene in the show, where Bunce is being kicked off. That detective is being kicked off the force for losing his temper and and uh, hitting the police chief in the face and whatever. He um, he's sitting alone and with the fact that he's going to lose his profession as a cop, and it's always ever wanted to be. And S- Sid, his, the, the, who had this, this star moment here, his informant, it, you know, it comes to him and tries to comfort him, and Bunt says, um, I don't see myself being a cop again. And it's just so, such a pained moment. Um, and uh, Sid says to him, you're the, best, you're the best guy I ever knew, which is as close as people like this come to a... a, a to sentimentality. Know, to sentimentality. And, uh, you know, Bunt says, thanks, and uh, I'm going I'm to go for a walk now. And he leaves, and um, my boss at the time loved the scene and um, didn't change a word, but he, he stopped. He, the only thing he did was as Bunt you can starts. identify the boss. As, as, uh, oh, well, David Milch, you have here, David right? David Milch. And the only thing he did to the scene was right before Bunt leaves, after having Sid saying, oh, you're the best guy I ever knew, um, he says, uh, Oh, and if you pass a convenience store, can you pick me one of those? Pick up one of those orange pops. And uh, and Bun says, if 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 I think of it, you know, if it's if they're open or something like that. And he leaves. It was the only change that he made. But it was a brilliant change, and it taught me a lot. I was a, a new writer; it was my first show, because it had a kind of a not that not so much that it cut the treacle of the sentimentality of the moment, because that was untouched. I mean, in a sense, you couldn't. But because it was an irrelevant detail. It was a, a, just a sort of thing that just happens in life and is just stuck to. We don't, the scenes we play in real life, no matter what the scene is, you know, you're told your wife is leaving you or whatever, whatever the scene is, it never happens without a little orange pop in it, you know, without something. The phone rings and it's a, it's a, it's a solicitation, you know, from Hillary Clinton's campaign or something, right in the middle of the most dramatic moment of your life. Uh, you know, th- that kind of thing inflects. We don't get to play out the scenes of our life in, on, under a proscenium arch with perfect artistic timing. And that kind of knowledge in TV's shoddy little form is very good at, 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 uh, at conveying. So that was it. But, that's the, that, but that tells you more about the relationship between these, these two guys. And I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a violent cop show. It wasn't uh, you know, great art by all standards. But, but you were able to explore human, human emotions and human... Uh, Relations, and I hope a little bit redeem the... Uh, right, well, and also, you know, the tone of that show was especially complicated because it was full of comic, weird, strange, unexpected moments like this. But that's yeah. history, and I think we should look forward to what, you know, what television might be and, in the future and, and, and um, what movies might be. And I see this young generation of filmmakers um, making movies that are really... Uh, the smallness, they're about something. They have much more to do with John Sayles than they do with David Melch. I mean, they have much more to do with... with um, Making movies in your backyard with unknown actors, um, telling stories about what you really know. This is really exciting. They're fresh. They have a lot of heart. They're so far a little mild, they can go much further, you know. Um, and they drift off into a kind of easy comedy. You think of the Wilson brothers, you know, really good kids, who who gone from the that kind of film I'm describing, like Bottle Rocket, to very big, broad Hollywood comedies that, you know, are seem to be less interesting. So there's a danger that they'll sell out like so many before them. But in general, there's something about this generation of, as I was saying, Nancy Oliver and, 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 the, and the filmmakers of, uh, uh, of the, some of these smaller comedies that, that, uh, that I, I expect great storytelling, great narrative, great human truth. I don't know what their economic and technological future is, but um, you can't keep people from telling... Uh, uh, stories. When I see this, I see something that strikes me as really funny, very old-fashioned, very, uh, right. and, and and but 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 paved the way for a kind of truth and honesty in, in in storytelling. It's not a it's not it's not a bad it's not a bad it's a bad time for the big Hollywood movies, and it's a bad time for the big hits. I don't think there's a lot about you know Grey's Anatomy or something that I would uh, that would excite my artistic. Um, uh, appetite if I were a young filmmaker. I wouldn't be rushing out to direct an episode of 
of, of, of that. Um, and the business is mostly that lipstick jungle, God help us, you know. I mean, you know, there's, there'll, always, there'll always be a lot of uh, uh, crap. Um, but I think there's, uh, but there's also little corners of both movies and less often television where you could see people coming along and saying something new. And so they don't come out of literature and theater and things the way, uh, the way we did. They, there's still stories, uh, stories to tell. So, you know, I really do feel positive about what the, the new crop of filmmakers will do. Thank you very much. Audience, thank you, John. Thank you.